Howdy folks, Joel at Earth Tools here. We're gonna do a little video on taking apart a grease type drive unit for a sickle bar. Here on the bench, we've got an old BCS sickle bar drive unit. This is sometimes referred to as the sickle bar gearbox, but it's not really a gearbox because there are no gears in it, but it's the, it's the assembly on the sickle bar that transfers the motion from rotary motion to reciprocating motion so that your rotary PTO can drive a reciprocating sickle bar. As I say, this is a real old BCS one here. Um, and this is, this is, like I said uh, earlier, this is in relation to the dry type or greasable type drive units. This, does, this video is not going to apply to the double action or the oil bath units. This is specific for the, the uh, dry type. These are also, this dry type uh, video here or single action, uh, this procedure is going to apply to the grillo units as well that are single, uh, single action dry type. So first I'm going to take off this little guard. I've got a nut and a bolt here. The bolt goes all the way through the bottom of the housing. Take that off. All right. Take this off the top. There goes the phone. Now this unit here, this particular machine, is so old. This is like a pre-1980 unit, and the. Uh, the, you can see that this is an Allen head set screw here. Uh, on the later models, you won't find that unless it's a Grillo. The current Grillo machines still use the Allen head set screw, but BCS went away from that, went to a different system. And I'll talk about that, more about that in a minute. So, what we've exposed here is the swivel assembly. Uh, if, you, if you look at this here, this is your PTO flange that mounts to the walk behind tractor. And of course, this is the housing that's going to mount to the blade assembly of your sickle bar. So the, uh, when you have the sickle bar attachment bolted to the tractor, you'll notice that the sickle bar can float a little bit, just like this right here. And that's so that the sickle bar floats to follow the contours of the ground if you're going over lumpy terrain. So it's not just a rigid unit. So that's what we're seeing right here. We've got the PTO flange assembly can rotate slightly within this main housing. What holds this PTO flange assembly here, and I'm touching it on both ends because this is the same part. You can see that it all rotates together. The inner part of this goes all the way through here. What holds this into this assembly on these old sickle bars is this Allen head set screw. It goes down through this housing into a slot that's cut in this piece right, to the, right that lines up with this thing. Now on the later model BCS machines, starting after 1980 or so, what they did is they added a little boss, kind of a, 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 a lump of material that comes out to the side. And then you can see that they'll, they'll have a, a, a roll pin driven in there. And they, that roll pin is driven all the way across and it goes through that slot. The slot is cut all the way around the circumference of this piece and the roll pin kind of just uh, goes through the top of that slot like this and allows it to rotate in there, but it can't come out. Well, the roll pin was a little better idea than this thing. The, the problem with this Allen head set screw is it's just got a little tang on the end that inserts down into that slot and eventually it can get worn away. Well, they said the roll pin has more surface material in that slot, so it's gonna last longer. Well, the problem with the roll pin is that <laughs> when the roll pin wears away, and you try to remove it, the center portion of the roll pin, which has been rubbing on that slot, is it, it, it just wears through. And when you try to drive it through from one side to the other, the roll pin collapses onto itself because there's no body to the middle of it. This is a nightmare because getting that roll pin out of there is just, a, it's an act of Congress. You gotta pretty much take a carbide drill bit and drill the thing out. So BCS learned their lesson, and by the mid-1980s, they said, well, that hole was a good idea, but we're just going to put a long bolt and a nut through it. So on the very latest machines, uh, up to the you know, last years of production where BCS offered this drive-type sickle bar, it was, this boss was here, but it had a 6-millimeter nut and bolt going all the way through it with a 10-millimeter bolt and nut head on each side. Those are the easiest to deal with because you just remove the nut and bolt, slide it out, and then this assembly can come apart. Anyway, I'm going to remove this. We're going to see what this looks like. 
You can see that little tit on the bottom there that'll extend into the slot. Now that I've removed that, or now that I've removed my roll pin, if I had a roll pin in there, or now that I've removed my nut and bolt, what that's going to do is that's going to allow this assembly to pull in and out a little bit. See, I've got a little play here now. And if you notice, the, how, the main housing here on the outside is comes out further on this side than it does this side. See how this is cut away right here? Well, that is to let this oscillator assembly, because this is the oscillator, this is when the, when the shaft of the PTO is turning, this thing is going round and round, and it's making the blade obviously go back and forth out here on the front. Well, this wobble shaft, or the eccentric shaft, you can see what it's shaped like. Well, if it's on this side and you try to pull this thing back, it won't go very far until this hits this, right? Well, over here, you've got more clearance. So on this side here, I can get this thing offset and actually let me grab a little mallet here. And what you can do, you can drive this thing back far enough that this bearing actually comes out of here. That's how you get this thing apart. That's how you separate the oscillator assembly from the rest of the yoke assembly here. Um, Otherwise, I've seen people try to remove this yoke assembly by reaching under here and trying to get one of these bolts out and then pulling the whole thing up and, and forward. But that's an absolute nightmare because you can't get to this bolt when this thing is in the way. Now I can get to the bolt because I can swing this off to the side because the bearing in the back is disconnected. So if I want to remove this whole yoke assembly now, I just swivel it over here, take that bolt out, you know, and, and when I have enough clearance, I can take that bolt out. Then I can tap the bottom of this thing and drive the bearings up out of this housing. But this is the trick in terms of getting enough clearance here so that this bearing separates. This thing has to go over to this side where the cutaway is. And in order to do that, you need to get out whatever is holding this assembly from sliding back, whether it be the set screw type, the roll pin type, or the, uh, the nut and bolt. If you have an older unit or one of the mid-range mid units that has the roll pin in it and you manage to get the roll pin out successfully, throw that roll pin as far away as you can and replace it with a 6 millimeter nut and bolt. We have them in stock here at Earth Tools. Uh, but if that roll pin, like I say, that roll pin is just a time bomb. So if, you've, if you're watching this video and you go out and look at your machine, you see a roll pin drilled in through there, has never been removed probably a good idea to try to remove it and replace it before the thing causes trouble because if, it, if that roll pin ever shears in there, you're doomed. So anyway, to get this thing back together. Now, if I needed to replace this bearing, of course, I could do so. You can put a, a, bear, a bearing puller on this, uh, like a gear puller, pull that bearing off of there. Uh, you also see that there is a, a, uh, a shield, like a bronze shield. You can't see that it's bronze very well, but well, you can if I scratch away all the grass and grit that's on there, but that bronze shield is very important. That's a grit shield uh, that keeps the dirt out of this bearing. Basically, that bronze shield is kind of a conical thing, and it's just pinched in between the bearing and the housing here. And that one's a little loose. We might actually replace that. See, there's some slop on there. I can move it around. Yeah, that, we're going to replace that. I don't like that. That thing's worn out. But if, you, if, they, if that thing gets too loose there, what will happen is grit will start getting into the bearing. The idea is that with this grease fitting here, when you put grease in here, it goes through the center of the shaft, comes out in here, and forces its way back through the bearing. It'll push out between the bearing and the bronze shield. So it'll flush all the grit out of there, for the most part, and lubricate the bearing. And then as the sickle bar runs, it'll eventually throw that grease out by centrifugal force and you have to regrease it. On these grease type units, this bearing is the most important bearing to grease. It should be greased every four to six hours of operation. This is the only bearing that actually makes a full circle in this whole assembly. All these other bearings just go back and forth, back and forth, up and down, up and down. They are not throwing the grease out nearly as fast. This one is going all the way around in a circle, and it's not only going in a full circle, it's going in an oblong circle, so its centrifugal force is greater. So this is the one that needs to be greased the most often. Uh, like I say, every four to six hours of operation, usually you just go ahead and hit the other fittings on it while you're at it, but you'll find that the grease does not come out of those as quickly. Now, if you need to disassemble this yoke assembly here, that's a... That's quite a job because there are, there are caps on either end. Uh, BCS, for some reason, 
uses these, uh, yeah, they're, they're just, <laughs> they're like a solid cap. It's in most U-joint, if you look at a universal joint on a car or truck, they'll use some kind of a snap ring on, a, on the end of a bearing assembly like this. BCS uses a cap that starts out as a, like a, a spherical cap and they put it in there and you beat it flat with a big punch and what it does is it, it expands out into the groove that's cut around the inside of this, locking it and locking the bearing caps in place. To get those out, it's almost impossible. You have to either put a chisel on them and bang on them and just destroy the cap. You can drill a hole through it and try to pry it out of there. Or in most cases, what you do is simply wait until the bearing goes out and it blows the cap out of the ends and then you've got the whole thing is flopping around. But it's an extremely difficult system to service and I don't know why BCS uses these caps. Whenever we replace these bearings, we just put regular circlips back in. Uh, Grillo uses circlips on theirs from the get-go, which are much easier to get in and out. And I don't, we don't have any problems with them falling out, so I don't know why BCS uses this system. But um, if you get replacement bearings from us, we're going to supply them with clips rather than these stupid uh, expanding cap deals. Um, but anyway, to replace these, uh, it's a matter of sort of putting this, I'm not going to do this right now because these bearings are in good shape and I don't need to take it apart. Everything's nice and tight here and, you know, we don't have any slop. But if, I, if, this, if these bearings were blown out, I would, you know, remove these bolts, knock this assembly up out of here and off, and then I would, uh, you know, get what's left of the caps and the bearings out of there. And basically, you press the two bearings in. I'll usually use a vise. I'll open up a vise, put some sockets in the vise to use as pushers to push those bearings in there. You've got to be really careful because these, need, these are needle bearings. There's multiple needle bearings that are just held in there by grease. And if you're not careful when you get those needle bearings in there, if you're sloppy with it, you can, you can turn one of the needles sideways in there and it won't go all the way on because you've got a needle like trapped under the end of the bearing. So you just have to use some care and um, patience and make sure they go in all the way and that, you know, when it's all together, the, bear, the snap rings drop right into their grooves. And if you're having to beat it to get the snap ring in, you know there's a problem. You need to take it back apart and see if there's a bearing that's turned sideways. But usually, if you're careful and there's plenty of grease inside the bearings, you just, on the inside of the new bearing assembly, you just run your finger around with some grease on it and make sure those bearings are all pressed against the inside edges. And that will usually do it. And then getting this thing back together, of course, you'll just put a new bearing on here if needed, put a new shield on if needed, and then just bring this thing back into place and tap that until it comes all the way back forward and then put whatever locking mechanism you've got back in there to hold this whole thing in place. Another thing I want to mention on these, on the latest, well I shouldn't say the latest, but the, on the later model units there's also a grease fitting on the side here. This one does not have it because it's super old. But what the grease fitting on the side does, does two things. It lubricates the bearings going on this vertical side-to-side -side shaft here. This, this grease fitting actually just lubricates these two needle bearings. It does not go down into these other bearings on the bottom. But anyway, they added the one down here to lubricate the bearings in here. But also, this does another important thing. It will push grease back up through this housing. This housing is actually hollow up the center. And it will lubricate this swivel joint because this needs lube too. That thing is moving as the tractor is moving around on uneven ground. And what you do to make sure that gets lubricated, this is a goofy system, but it works. You got these two bolts right here. People say, what the hell are those for? Well, there's two reasons that those bolts exist. One is they hold on a potential sickle bar weight. There was a horseshoe shaped weight that was available to put on this thing to add counterbalance weight to the sickle bar and those are the bolts that held it down. The other thing those bolts do is there are air bleed holes. So if I was doing a total service on the sickle bar, which we are gonna do, uh, and it had one of these grease fittings on the side, I would take out these two bolts put my grease nipple on here and pump and pump and pump and pump and eventually that grease gets forced back up through the housing and when you see the grease coming out these holes it means it made it all the way up to the swivel. Now if you don't take out those bolts the grease won't go up there. It'll just come out around this bearing. So if you put, if you've got a fitting here and you plug a uh, grease fitting on there and start pumping it's going to come out around this bearing unless you take out these air bleed holes. Then you pump until it comes out the air bleed holes put the bolts back in and pump a little more, then it'll come right around this bearing and you know the whole thing's full of grease, you're good to go. 
That's a process you do about once a year. You don't have to do it every time. And I think that's about it. Thanks for watching.